in the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So in addition to this being the second Sunday of Lent, uh, making our way into that season, um, this week we will also find ourselves marking a religious holiday that very few people will celebrate religiously, which is St. Patrick's Day. You know? and, and that's great. I mean, Kansas City's parade, you know, the parade downtown will make its comeback on Thursday, and the, the Brookside St. Patrick's Parade has been rescheduled for this Saturday because of the bad weather and the last week. And taking part in Brookside's parade has been a strong tradition for us here. And I'm really grateful to those who are uh, getting us ready again to celebrate alongside our neighbors. It's always a good time. Um, we'll put on a lawn party uh, for families as they gather waiting for the parade to start. And, you know, serving up hot dogs and um, offering a bouncy house. In addition, HJ's uh, will be sort of the green room for the parade's leaders and special guests and all, and we're, we're happy to get to work with our friends at the Brookside Business Association to, to make HJ's available and, and help put the parade on. So the parade is one way we're going to celebrate St. Patrick. Um, we will also gather over at HJ's a week from today, uh, next Sunday night, for Irish Pub Night. We'll, uh, we'll begin with a little prayer and scripture in St. Patrick's honor, and then we'll simply be together, just, you know, along with friends from the neighborhood, I hope, um, raising a glass and enjoying some traditional Irish music from uh, the boys of the Prairie Celtic Band, who have been here before and are really, really good. Now, you may wonder, <clears throat> reasonably, perhaps, if we're celebrating St. Patrick, why aren't we having a service in his honor? And, and that would be a fine thing to do. Uh, nothing wrong with a good liturgy and the chance to sing St. Patrick's Breastplate, you know. But, but I kind of think Patrick might prefer that we honor him in the community rather than here in the church. And here's why. You, you have to know his story. Um, now, now we, we may know Patrick as the, <clears throat> the saint who supposedly drove the snakes out of Ireland and all that, but his real story is actually much more interesting. Um, it's, it starts with him being kidnapped from his native England and enslaved in Ireland, where he learned about the people there and their way of life. Uh, and remarkably sort of fell in love with the people there and their way of life and, and the beauty of that place despite being held in slavery. It, kind of remarkably, his experience there left him not embittered but inspired. Um, inspired to help people in Ireland find relationship with God as he had found relationship with God there in Ireland. So, Patrick escaped, um, guided by a a divine dream of a boat um, at a port ready to take him away, which ended up being true. And he made his way back to England, eventually, where he trained for the priesthood and served a parish. But then a, another divine dream changed his life when he heard in this dream, heard his former captors in Ireland asking him to come back. And he interpreted it as a call from God to go and share the good news there uh, and, and proposed a, a missionary venture to his superiors. So they affirmed this call and ordained Patrick a bishop, um, but with no existing church to oversee. The, the first missionary bishop in Christian history, I think. So, so in 432, Patrick and his compatriots arrived in Ireland and turned the church's assumptions about how to do mission upside down. Because before Patrick, uh, the, the Roman church had assumed that its, its faith could only thrive in Roman culture. It, like If the people hadn't been taught to speak Latin and live a Roman lifestyle, the, the assumption was that Christianity couldn't really happen there. Now, of course, that kind of thinking led to centuries of really ugly Christian mission around the world with 
people killing the culture in order to save it. But, but Patrick, centuries ahead of his time, w was trying to show the church how, how truly to be mission-shaped. So he would take a dozen or so friends, assist assistants, whatever, into a village and get to know the folks there, get involved in their day-to-day -day lives, and, and just, you know, live as Christians among them, narrating their faith stories and their trust in God. And the result would be an indigenous church, a church that rose up from the place where they were, and one that actually remained once the team moved on, which they did. The, the, the estimates are that Patrick and his associates raised up expressions of church in something like 700 locations in Ireland over the course of the 28 years he was there. Because more than anything else, Patrick was gifted at taking people seriously. He, he, he knew their culture, and knew their language, and knew that building a relationship between them and God would change their hearts just as it had changed his. It all worked. And back in Britain, back at the home office, um, the bishops who had sent Patrick generally condemned him and distanced the institutional church from his methods. They, they disowned Patrick because, wait for it, <laughs> We'd never done it that way before. The, the creed of the institutional church, right? We'd never done it that way before. The, the bishops didn't know what to do with someone who wanted the church to engage with people as they were instead of expecting them to become something else first. So the, the English bishops condemned Patrick for spending so much time with the barbarians. They, I guess they would have preferred that he spend his day in the office, so to speak, you know, rather than out there in the bars and coffee shops with the pagans. Well, anyway, we, we know Patrick as um, a tremendously successful model of a Christian missionary. Um, but, but what are we supposed to do with that? You know, especially here we are two Sundays into Lent, this this penitential season of Lent. I mean, celebrations of St. Patrick seem about as contrary to Lent and self-discipline as you can get, I guess, depending on what you've given up. But, but I think there's a tie between Patrick's approach to doing church and what we heard actually in the Gospel reading, which of course is not about Patrick, but there's some good stuff there anyway. And Jesus in that reading, I think, is seeing himself in the tradition of the prophets. You know, the people like, like Micah and Amos and Hosea and John the Baptist too, for that matter. People who spoke truth that the religious and political establishment did not want to hear in their day. You know, speaking for God, the prophet said things like, your rulers give judgment for a bribe and your priests teach for a price, and your prophets give oracles for money. And, and elsewhere, this, the, this is from Amos, the, the prophet said, I, again, speaking for God, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn religious assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs, because it all seemed artificial. Instead, speaking for God, the prophet said, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God? The, the, the prophets back in the day saw a religious institution that was mostly concerned with its own interests, ensuring that it held its power while basically ignoring the lives of the people around it. So in today's reading, Jesus is fulfilling those prophets' calls and, and saying to the leaders there in Jerusalem, the leaders of the temple, look, God's done with you. See, your house is left to you, he says. The, the temple that symbolizes the leaders' focus on their own privilege and power. And I, I, what I hear Jesus saying there is that following God's way takes a transformation of heart and 
action and, and character rather than insisting that people follow your rules of worship and piety. And because he's speaking that truth, Jesus knows that the, the same response awaits him that usually comes to people like St. Patrick who tell God's represent, representatives what they really don't want to hear. The end is not so good. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, of course, that like the St. Patrick's Parade or Irish Pub Night is an example of speaking truth to power. Uh, I mean, we're, not, we're not exercising our prophetic voice in that way. But, but they are examples of something important and related, I think, which is us bending our heart as a church toward the neighbors that God's given us, prioritizing them and, and coming alongside them, living a life of faith. And our, our trailside service at HJ's is another example of the same impulse. I, I think St. Patrick helps us see that the church is, is fundamentally about relationship, ab about asking that question, who is my neighbor? And, and then reaching out to them and, and then being open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in response. In, in fact, that focus on relationship um, is what guided our vestry retreat this, this past month, this last month, where, where we were looking at why we're here as a congregation and discerning a new purpose statement for our life together. There, there'll be more on that in the weeks ahead, but, but, but I, I think St. Patrick would smile at the notion that Jesus' church is fundamentally about the work of building relationships with the next people you don't know. Because there's always somebody you don't know. Now, I think that's why we come out for a lawn party and a parade, uh, and, and why we gather for pub night, just as we gathered with our neighbors for Oktoberfest a few months ago. You know, the, the arc of the church's life must bend toward relationship. It's, it's by becoming invested in the people around us that we carry on the mission of the one who came to be among us and reconcile all people with each other and with God. So when we follow in his footsteps out the doors of the church, I think we can say with some integrity, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.